evening. How is everyone? Thank you all for joining us on our midweek service. Would you kindly stand with us? Let us pray. Lord, we are grateful. Thank you for another opportunity to meet. We ask for your presence even as we start our service. In Jesus' name.
ground and worship you. Oh, be lifted above.
it all to you Withholding nothing Oh, withholding nothing oh, You are
worship. You're deserving of everything that we are. It all belongs to you. And we thank you so much that you have given us this opportunity to raise our voices to you in worship, to just be in your presence. And even as we start this service, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be poured out upon us, O oh Lord, that we would receive your, your word, that our hearts would be softened to your word, dear Lord. I pray that you would be with us throughout this entire service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, before you sit down, say hi to your neighbor. Enjoy the service. Good evening, wonderful to see you here tonight. As we continue studying God's Word, And our prayer is always that as we go through God's Word, you can always go home and review and reread and think about what uh, we learned or what we read so that we are all in the same page. But all in all, we continue with our study, and today we begin Second Samuel. Um, this would be the book that will highlight um, the records of David's reign first over a territory of Judah and finally over the entire nation of Israel. And this is where we also trace the ascension of David to the throne that God had spoken before. And we'll also see David's sin, consequences of those sins, and what happened after that. So we'll begin... From chapter 1, maybe we'll just do the first chapter today. Part of this chapter we are going to do today is a song also that David wrote and um, instructed the children of Israel to always remember it at all times. So let us pray before we read God's Word. Lord, we thank you again for the privilege to be here tonight. Thank you that you're here with us and teaching us your Word. We pray tonight that you would speak to us, Lord. Your Word is alive, your Word is powerful, and we know that your Holy Spirit is here to uh, speak to us tonight. So as we read this Word, we pray 
that you, O oh God, alone would speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. And actually, I have titled this part of the Bible that we're going to read as The Falling of the Mighty. So last week, we saw what happened with uh, Saul and his sons. The Bible told us that uh, there was war, and Saul, his sons died, also is hammer bearer. So Saul and his hammer bearer, they both killed themselves. And the question was, was did they commit? suicide. <laughs> you know, what was that that they did? And we'll see a very uh, sneaky, sneaky story with a young man who brought word back to David. So last week when we read, I think it was very clear that uh, when these people had came upon Saul so hard and he was not dead yet, he decided that he will not bear the shame of the Philistine taking his head off. Um, that would be very shameful for him. So he decided that he will, you know, throw himself into his own... Um, spear or knife and kill himself but there's a young man who will give us a different version of that story and let us read together now it came to pass after the death of Saul when David had returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites and David had stayed two days in Ziklag on the third day behold it happened that a man came from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dust on his head. So it was when he came to David that he fell to the ground and prostrated himself. And David said to him, Where have you come from? So he said to him, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. Then David said to him, How did the matter go? Please tell me. And he answered, The people have fled from the battle. Many of the people are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan his son are dead also. So David said to the young man who had told him, How do you know that Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead? David is getting um, concerned with this battle. He knows that there was a battle between the Israelites and the Philistines and that Saul and his sons were in there, and when this guy is bringing back report, you know, he's saying, you know, people have fled, and, you know, at that point you think maybe Saul also has gone away, and his sons, and they have retrieved and gone. But then he's told again that uh, many people have fallen, and that includes Saul and Jonathan. And though we have read uh, from, you know, the, the, the first book that we were studying, that though Saul was always after David's life, there was always a part of David that never wanted to do Saul harm. Why? Because he was anointed of God. God had anointed him to be king over his own people. So it was always by some sort of fear, David never wanted to touch him. 
And secondly, his best friend is now dead. This is a man who, you know, they, they, they even cut blood. They made a covenant. This is one man that probably he never wanted to lose for anything. They were good friends, very good friends. And now uh, he's told that they are all dead. So David said to the young man, how? Who told you? How do you know? How would you be in the middle of where the king and his son are dead and you're alive? What, what really happened? What transpired? So the young man who told him said, As I happened by chance to be on a Mount Gibor, there was Saul leaning on his spear. And indeed, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. Now when he looked behind, Behind him, he saw me and called to me, and I answered, Here I am. And he said to me, Who are you? So I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said to me again, Please stand over me and kill me, for an anguish has come upon me, but my life still remains in me. So I stood over him and killed him because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was on his head and the bracelet that was on his arm and have brought them here to my Lord. It is amazing that on, on Sunday we just learned that there, there were people who were struck dead <laughs> because they lied, and they lied to the Holy Spirit. You know, you, you don't lie this kind of lies, and you go free. Every sin will be punished at some point. You cannot get away with, with that kind of sin. When we read the Bible, we were told that this, they pursued Saul so hard. And when he fled him and the armor bearer, Saul said, these people, I don't want to go through the pain of losing my life to these uncircumcised men. He told his armor bearer to kill him. But his armor bearer could not do that, so he killed himself. The armor bearer saw that Saul had killed himself. He in turn killed himself. So this story of this young man, where does it come from? And it is crafted nicely. I don't know if you guys are following. It is, it is brilliant how he, you know, you, you can lie with such a confidence. Standing before David, and you know for sure that perhaps he will think highly of you because you have killed him. But, you know, this man has been haunting your life for years, over 15 years. Who cares whether he's died or not? But this, this kind of lies, it's, it's dangerous what he just did. David had asked him, how do you know that Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead? And I think even before he got to David, he had already planned this in his mind. If I am asked how he died, this is what I'm going to say. I have brought evidence that this man is dead. Of course, there's evidence. There's a crown. There's the jewelry. There's the, 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 the robe. There is the evidence that Saul is dead. 
I mean, do you think, you know, that the rest of the Israelites who reign for their lives, now everyone is going to be happy that Saul is dead? Perhaps some will, some will not. One of those people who will not is David. He had a chance to kill him, but he did not. So now when he looked behind him, he saw me and he called to me and I answered, here I am. <laughs> if you must lie, maybe you need to learn from this guy. Because <laughs> this, is, this is the response that people give when, when your Lord, when the king calls to you, do you know what you say? Here I am. You know, even Samuel, when he was called upon by God and he didn't know how to respond, he was taught by Eli. The next time you hear a voice, say, here I am, Lord. <laughs> here I am. And now this guy knows. He knows the language. Do you know we have a lot of people in this world, a lot of people in in our church, a lot of people in the churches all over the world who have mastered the church language. They're not born again at all, but they have mastered church language. This is how you speak to church-going people. You go where they are, you start. So, buona sifiwe, buona sifiwe tena. <laughs> I don't know who came up with that. You, you have to say it twice. Praise God. Praise God again. You know, all the high schools, maybe, this is the trend. Praise God. Praise God again. And then they will read you Exodus. <laughs> Thou shalt not steal. Whoever stole, <laughs> whoever stole my plate, whoever stole my sweater, my shoes, my socks, whatever, we got to use the Bible so that at least there's fear. Return. Praise God. Praise God again. The politicians will use it. Business people will use it because they know it is kind of inclusive. Many people are religious. Many people go to church, even those that are not born again. We have learned the art, the language, how to, you know, say these words and, you know, and get away with things. He saw me and he called to me and I answered, here I am. And he said to me, who are you? So I answered him, I am an Amalekite. Maybe Saul would have thought, these people, <laughs> some time back, I was supposed to destroy all these people. They were supposed to be killed, all of them. Who is this that I'm calling into and he's... He belongs to the people that I was supposed to utterly destroy. I didn't, and he's right here. Who is supposed to finish who right now? And because this young man knew that Saul was dead for sure, and no one would have gotten, you know, there, there were no media people to bring the voiceovers, to bring the videos of what is happening. You know what is happening in our world today? That even when people are perishing, people are about to die, they are drowning. No one is ready to help, but we are ready to record the evidence of how it happened. I, I wonder what you're going to do with that video in your own house when you're seated, you're relaxed. Is it a sign of victory that you went out and this is what you saw? We see houses burning to the ground and we only have videos of them. We see people killing each other, we have videos. We see cruel things happening in the world, but all we can do is to record and post them on our timelines and to see how many people have viewed them. <laughs> Nikona views 1.4 in, in 30 minutes. 90k views, imagine in two days. Those are the things that are exciting the world. 
maybe this guy would, would have been very famous, <laughs> you know, trending the, the death of the king. And the caption would be, the mighty has fallen. And he said to me, please stand over me and kill me. For an anguish has come upon me, but my life still remains in me. So I stood over him and killed him because I was sure that he could not live. I mean, who are you to take the life of anyone? It doesn't matter whether they are gasping for their last breath. Who are you to take people's life? I'm saying I knew they were going to die anyways. And I took the crown that was on his head, the bracelet that was on his arm, and I brought them to my Lord. <laughs> brought them to you, my Lord. Therefore David took hold of his clothes and tore them, so did all men who were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son. For the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. Then David said to the young man who told him, Where are you from again? Where are you from? And he answered, I am the son of an alien, an Amalekite. So David said to him, How was it you were not afraid to put forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Wow. How was it? Was that your business? Instead of saving him, you have a life. Uh, I don't know if even what he did was real, that he, you know, splashed blood on his clothes, take dust and covered himself to, to, to tell David and that the, the rest of the people that, man, it was not easy. It was bad. This is what I recovered from, you know, the battle. Why are you not even afraid to take a sword and to think of laying your hand against this man? You are an Amalekite. Do you know who anointed this man to be king over Israel? And by what authority, by what strength? This is not good. Because David is, David is all thinking, man, whoever did this, it is not going to be well with him. You do not just lay your hands on a man who was appointed by God. Though we know that he's, you know, he, he did a lot of things that were not right. But it is not your place. It is not your place to kill them. It is not. Where are you from? How was it you are not afraid? to put forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed. Then David called one of the young men and said, Go near and execute him. And he stuck him so that he died. So David said to him, Your blood is on your own head, for, you, for your own mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed 
the Lord's anointed. These are the words that David is saying when this man is being executed. And he died. You know why he died? Because he lied. If he didn't lie about it, his life would have been spared. And say, this is, this is what I saw, my Lord. I was this and this place. I was hiding. This is what happened. And after he was fallen, I brought this as an evidence for you to know that the anointed one of God has fallen. Do you think his life would have been taken? Probably not. But the mistake was, you lied about it. In fact, you said with your own tongue that I killed him. The anointed one of God has fallen. I have killed the Lord's anointed. Then David lamented with his with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son. And he told them to teach the children of Judah the song of the bow. Indeed, it is written in the book of Joshua. And this is a song that he wrote. The beauty of Israel is slain on your high places. The beauty of Israel that basically is the, the royalty, the kingship. The beauty of Israel is slain on your high places. How the mighty has fallen. He's going to say this word like three times. How the mighty has fallen. Tell it not in God. Proclaim it not in the street of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistine rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. Now think about these words when David is writing this song. This is a man who has been chasing his life over 15 years. And now when he's, you know, he's fallen, he's like, hey, how the mighty is fallen. He's not giving us the details, but we know the details throughout the book of First Samuel, what happened, you know, how he began well, and he ended up in the ditches, ended up executing himself. And we'll see those aspects as we end up tonight. You see, don't, don't go to the Philistine. Don't go there and tell them about this. You know what they will do? They will go in the streets. They will rejoice about it. They will write songs about it. And the reason why I don't want you guys to do that is because you guys should remember that this man was anointed by God. He was God. He was leading God's people. He's led God's people. In his fallen estate, he was still God's anointed. That is why I did not lay my hands upon him. Respect that. Don't let these uncircumcised people triumph against the anointed one. O mountains of Gibor, let there be no dew, no rain upon you, nor fields of offerings, for the shield of the mighty is cast away there. The shield of soul, not anointed with oil, from the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bar of Jonathan did not turn back, and the sword of Saul did not return empty. Saul and Jonathan were beloved and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. 
They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. O daughter of Israel, weep over soul who clothed you in scarlet with luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel, how the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan was slain in your high places. I am distressed for you, my friend Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen and the weapon of war perished. David doesn't want people to forget them. Because, you know, if, you know, without this kind of words, for David instructing them, people would just have said, well, they are lived a king, but his end was this. His, he, they would have said so cruel words to this man. Kindness would have not been the portion of the writers who would, you know, write poems and things about this man. But even at the end of this man who did not walk with the Lord, David still instructed people to remember him in this manner. That even uh, in the midst of the battle, Jonathan was slain in the high places. He said, I am distressed for you, my friend, <laughs> my brother Jonathan. And because of how the world has turned to be very sensitive, especially with issues to do with sexualities. They take this portion of Scripture out of context every time. If the Bible was, you know, if, if God wanted us to know of this kind of relationship, He would have detailed it for us so that we know what was happening. But you know what the Bible says? He, he, actually, David calls him who? My brother. His distress that soul is gone, but more so, he's lost a brother. He's lost a friend. And he says that his love for this man surpasses the love for women, of which we should have, we should, you know, bring David and actually ask him what he really meant. <laughs> what do you mean that this love surpasses the love for women? Because we shall see, and we already have seen it, that David has gone beyond the borders. And these borders are God made one man for one woman. Adam for Eve. We do not have the capacity to love many. Loving one is already trouble. I mean, training yourself to love one woman is already in itself what we are not able to handle. The rest of our lifetime, we are trying to figure out how to love one woman. You'll be clever, you'll be learned, you try to study things in the world. Trust me. You can study how to conquer the world and come back home and you still have trouble. You cannot even conquer one <laughs> in your own house and you think, you know, the world, the world goes easy. I can go just bring many more, many more. The more you add up, the more you're adding trouble to your own selves. And David's son knows that well, well, and he says, 
All is vanity, my friend. Vanity. He had 700 official wives, 300 concubines. So if you were to go to each house, when are you returning back to your first house? After a thousand, <laughs> how long is that? Think about it. Because I believe every woman wants his husband daily. It's, it's, it's non-negotiable. You're stuck with me here. <laughs> For G, forever. We ain't gonna share. Leave alone those people. Oh, da, oh to ta share, to see, see the way to water. Leave that nonsense alone. <laughs> Every woman wants his husband by, his, by her side 24 7. And he knew very well, and God knew that the more you take, these women, especially those coming from the, uh, the, you know, worshiping other gods, they will stray you away from God. You begin worshiping their God. And Solomon thought he was very clever. He asked for wisdom and God gave it. So what do you do? You go to this kingdom because I don't want to fight. Marry their daughter, marry their daughters, marry their daughter. And then when these daughters are coming, they are coming with their own gods. So bit by bit, you're compromising, compromising, going down and going down and going down. And Solomon, at the end of his life, he said, all these things, vanity upon vanity. And he's telling us that this is vanity, but we want to test, we want to have a taste of vanity. <laughs> How pathetic. You've been warned that this will kill you. Like, let me just test. I want to see how it fails. David has gone. He's already has multiple wives. Because he, he has divided the tension. That is probably why he's saying maybe, you know, his love, his, his affection. For this man is beyond. And of course, their friendship was godly. Their friendship had nothing to do with any form of sexuality. The Bible would have told us if it were. But it was not. This, if you were to have a friend today in that manner, you will not have peace with brethren and sisters in the world. <laughs> like, look at them. Look, look, look at the, the, the way they are clothed. Look at the way they do things. Every, you know, they, they are always together. They, they go to these places together. How they, how they speak to one another. Why? Because our world today is so sensitive that you, 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 you cannot be close to your brother. These Jewish people, they used to kiss on the cheek. Even men, I'm, I thank God we're not doing it today. Because our world today is weird. <laughs> Things are overboard. I mean, th think about it. Meeting two grown men in the street. Our world is different today. Even Paul was a bit cautious. He said, hey, great brethren with a holy kiss. Holy. <laughs> Add the word holy, capital, holy. Be mindful of the testimony of your kissing. But think about the mighty who is fallen. 
David is not giving us the, the, the records of his falling state, but we know it. That Saul's leadership was colored by, we have seen a lot of selfishness, wanting things for himself. Saul was waging war without God's command. You hear when David was, when David is walking with the Lord, what he said, God, can I go? Can I pursue them? Can I do this? Can I do this? And God says, yes, you can. How many times do we hear Saul saying, God, can I pursue the Amalekites? Can I pursue the Philistines? All the last time he pursued something, it was a witch somewhere. He didn't seek God's approval when he's going for battle. And he was seeking to prove that he was great. He was do, doing things out of selfish ambition. Willing to sacrifice others for his name's sake. That was Saul. We also saw that there was deep hatred in his heart. He hated David so much that he never rested. He would take the whole palace to go chase this one man. That is a man who is not walking with the Lord. If you're walking with the Lord, you will not gather troops to go hate on another, to pursue his life to destroy There was so much hatred in him. He was seeking praise for himself. And he violated God's provisions. In addition to being selfish, Saul also, also justified himself for every mistake he made. The self-justification of Saul is shown, for example, in the offering of the burnt offering without Samuel. The time was elapsing. We are supposed to go for battle. We are supposed to do this. And you're not here within the timeline that you are supposed to be here. You're supposed to be here within seven days. It's about time and you're not here. And I thought, let me just go ahead and do it. That is what sin will do in your life. You begin to justify things. That was in First Samuel 13, 18, 8 to 13. As well as in other self-justifications that he did, we have read them. Saul's leadership was ultimately built on an attitude of selfishness that formed negative attribute such as pride. He was a very prideful man. He was very disobedient to God. He was a greedy man. We saw that. And also he was in to building self-image. He just wanted to be popular. He, is, he wanted to be the man. He wanted to be the man so bad. And these things, trust me, in every man, there's a cry for greatness. God made it in men. That every man, every young man, every boy, they always want to be great. 
They always want to be recognized when they do something tangible. They want to risk their lives and do other things for the sake of others. It is, it is inbuilt in men. But there is also a line that has to be drawn. That why, why do you want to be great? Do you want to be great in the kingdom of God doing God's work? Or do you want this greatness to just come so that you can feel good about yourself? So that you can, you know, ignite your pride build your own empire and everything else will be just be revolving around you around you that is most of the men around the world when they are looking for things they, 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 they sometimes they well i don't think they're humble many times they know you give them that automatically they change and you know their heart was not into this they just wanted it so that they can enrich themselves pride we want to be popular and if pride is in us the decisions that we made or the decision that we'll be making, we'll know how they'll be. They'll not be this decision that will help other people. All of them will be geared to helping me. I will use you to help me. I will use you to get to the next level. I will use you to get this job. I will use you to get this promotion. I'll use whatever comes my way to get the promotion, to get to the place where I want to. The result of leadership that is controlled by selfishness is the retreat of the guidance of the Holy Spirit. You're never guided with God. And ultimately, this leads to destruction. This is because the purpose of this model of leadership is self-glory and not the glory of God who is the giver of all this life and all this responsibility that we see this man had the pride arrogance thinking that we cannot thinking that we can do things without god you can go to battle without inquiring of the lord and even when the lord would say well go then the things that you're going to do there are still things that are going to enrich yourself God says, go, go destroy all these things. And they say, because this is nice, this is nice, this is nice, I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to destroy them. That becomes a snare to you. Both in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, we see that God does not condone sin. Sin will be punished at the end of the day you might think well you've you, you're getting away with things and of course for the believer if you sin and you repent God forgives don't just be habitual sinner who oh, sin today like so as he did yesterday he's gonna do it today and even tomorrow so whatever I do in the flesh maybe it's not going to affect me much so I'm just gonna keep you know I'll, I'm, I'm gonna do this I'm gonna do this I'm gonna do this and David is saying how the mighty has fallen 
have fallen. This man was mighty. When he was chosen because the people wanted, God said, well, I'm going to give you this man. This man had an opportunity to make everything right. But he didn't. Went the other direction. And before we judge him so harsh, we are always on the trail. We are always there. This, they say history repeats itself. And we see it over and over. Did you guys see that in, in the book of Judges? <laughs> Vicious cycle that God delivers them. They repent. They turn back to God. And then after there's peace, back worshiping other gods and the idols and God uses the enemies to beat them so bad and then they cry to God God is merciful, they are delivered you think about it, just the cycle over and over over and over God did not let his people because they repented and be assured that in every generation, in every dispensation there are people who just cry just because we're mepigwa they are, they are sad. But also we have people who genuinely will cry to God and God will hear them. You know the reason why there is still order in this planet earth is because there are people who are crying honestly to God. We have remnants who are crying to God and God has preserved our nations. There are people day and night are praying for this country. These are the ministers of the gospel that we never see on TV. We never see them on the mega billboards. But they pray in the secret place. They say, God, deliver that man. God, give us peace in this country. God, if it's not of you, we know more. But God continues to give us his grace though we are being taxed though even tax my bible next time <laughs> you speak 10 words you're taxed for that i mean we, we are at, at this time we are not even afraid <laughs> we go ahead and tax whatever things they want to tax they want to tax everything 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 We're still going to be here. If the Lord tarries, we're still going to preach the, the gospel at whatever cost. These things, they will not bring the gospel to an end. Until when Jesus comes to pick the church. You know the assurance that there will be people who will be picked because the Bible says so. <laughs> because he will return to take the church. He will not return to take the building. This building and how decked it is and the, the, the good things that come with it, all these things will perish. They will remain here. He's coming back to take a people. A people who have said in their hearts that we are going to fight this battle. No matter what it takes, we are going to remain faithful. They don't want us to say all this. They, don't want, they, they want us to address them this way. <laughs> don't, don't call me by this name. But address me this way. Say, you know, it is already here in Kenya. It is already here in Eldoret. We are already interacting with this people, we, the, the, the devil is at work. Why should we sleep? When our adversary is working, he's having sleep. Well, he doesn't sleep anyways. <laughs> he doesn't. He's recruiting soldiers, as we said on Sundays. He knows that we are the temple of God. He also wants to reside there. He knows that we are the army of God. 
he wants to recruit traitors to come amongst us. Sadly, he has recruited traitors who are in the church. They are in the church, but they are not of God. They're just within to see what is happening, to see what is happening. Clothed in sheep clothing, but inside they are ravenous wolves. As you guys have heard it, it's been said in this pulpit many times. And you cannot tell a wolf to, you know, to, not to touch the sheep. You're already seeing blood in his mouth and you say, will you be a good wolf today? <laughs> will you? He won't. He's a wolf. When he remembers that he is a wolf, he behaves accordingly. When people remember that they are, you know, they, 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 they are not of the truth, they will say things accordingly. You know, the Bible tells us that uh, Satan is a liar. When he speaks lies, that is his native language. There's no truth in him. So whatever he says, believe that it is not the truth. It is a lie. Even when it seems nice and it's been crafted nicely and, you know, like this young man, like, he called unto me and I said, yes, my Lord. <laughs> the enemy uses people's lips to lie. And after you lie, you know, the end of the story, he died. He was killed. Let's remember, you know what we see here with this story is the mercifulness also of this man, David. The graciousness of this man, David. David is behaving like a king. He's the earthly king that is appointed by God, but he is pointing us to someone greater. A friend who sticks closer than a brother. A friend whose love supersedes the love for my wife and my child and my colleagues. A friend who knows that I have gone into the ditches, but he still can hold my hands when I return back to him. When I say, Lord, I'm in the fault. Lord, I am not able to take myself from this ditch. You know, David wrote and said, I cried unto the Lord, and he took me out of a miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, a steady rock, and established my goings, and gave me a new song to sing. Psalms 40. I was just sliding in my sins, sliding into them. Not um, just lying and lying and coming back to this and fornication and coming back to it and smoking and coming back to it, drinking and coming back to it, just going round and round. And you know what people will say at the end of the day? Nime jaribu. I have tried. This thing is not letting me go. I've tried. But have you cried to the Lord? You know, when the Bible writes and David says, I cry to the Lord, it is not an idea. David was not thinking of crying. He actually sobbed before the Lord. He cried as a man before the Lord. And the Lord heard his prayers. And any time that happens, David writes it. David is not ashamed of telling us he was in a ditch. 
He's not afraid of telling us that this is what I did. Staged a man to die so that I can take his wife. When the truth would come to David so hard, he would go back, tore his robe, and cry to God. This is a man that at the end of the day, God says, is a man after my own heart. And these are the events that contribute to that. He had the opportunity to kill Saul. He did not. And then another young man comes and says, I have killed. No, don't take that kind of glory, my friend. <laughs> Those kind of things will kill you. We see the graciousness of this man. We see the the Ananias concept. <laughs> Ananias means God is gracious. <laughs> being gracious. And that is how you will know that you're being governed and ruled by a true king when he's gracious with people. When his love supersedes the one that you know. Like how 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 be it that he still loves a man like me? I don't deserve this kind of love. I don't deserve this kind of mercy. And David says it. If you fall in the hands of the enemy, there's no mercy. If you fall in the hands of God, oh, there's forgiveness. There's tender mercy for you. You'll be preserved. Amen? I pray that we'll remember this thing. When we read this word, we remember the history because we, we have read since before uh, David came into play with uh, Samuel's birth and all these things. We see the, the, the story building up. We see now the kingdoms are being set up. We see how people, you know, they, they, they get into power and they just want things for themselves. We'll see the victories of David. We'll see the downfalls of David. The Bible never hides anything. So as you share life with other people, as you share life with colleagues and friends, know that your life can transform people greatly when you're honest. Tell people of where the Lord has taken you from. You don't have to be saved from smoking and killing and all that for people to know that, what will call them so? What will call them beard? <laughs> no, you, you don't. The fact that you were not born again and you're born again right now is in itself a testimony of God preserving you. I mean, you, you didn't die when you're not born again, though you did everything right, everything right. You remember that young man in the, in, in the Bible who uh, was telling Jesus, I have kept the law from my youth, everything. Then Jesus comes with just one. Say, okay, I know your attachment. I know your problem. <laughs> you have helped people. You know, out of, let's say, your, your, your net worth is 10 billion, and you've given 9 million to people. What is that? <laughs> you still got billions. You have millions of money. You have helped people here and there with unga. And at the end of the day, you're telling Christ, I have helped people. I have done this. Christ still knows that this thing is holding your heart. He's saying, okay, if that is the case, sell this and give it to the poor. And the Bible tells us that this young man went away sorrowfully. Why? Because Christ touched that button. You guys know your button? Because every one of you, every one of us, 
we have those buttons that when he touches, it's like, mm mm, this one leave it for now. I pray that when he comes and tells you, do this, you will not say, Lord, let me keep it. You say, it all belongs to you, anyways. So if you say, I give it, help me to let it go. Soul began well, ended bad, bad, and bad. Our end should be greater than where we began from. So as we are serving the Lord, whatever things you do for the kingdom of God, I pray that your end will even be better than today. I pray that your life will be fruitful. I pray that God will give you wisdom and more wisdom and more wisdom. Sometimes trouble comes into your life so that you'll be wise. You, you prayed for wisdom and God brings trouble in your life. He brings people that you're supposed to talk to and sometimes we wonder, what am I going to say to people? I got nothing of my own to tell them. I have my own troubles. <laughs> what am I going to say to people? But God, in his wisdom, I've seen that. He uses those moments for you to trust him. And when you go, and sometimes you want to speak, to even your friends, and you're so nervous, you don't know what to tell them. That is a good place to find yourself, by the way. As preachers, when we come in this, a lot of, it's good to have confidence when you're speaking to people, but when you're so confident and you're full of yourself, we know you'll talk about yourself so many times. You say things that are about self, 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 self. But when you let it, and we'll let the Holy Spirit guide you through what you have studied and read, it goes out there, how it ministers to people, we are not aware. What we know, it is, we have read God's Word, and even the reading of God's Word in itself is powerful. So as we read it, and we go through it in context, we pray that the Holy Spirit will help us, and He will give us wisdom. I pray that our, this church, when it began, it was not this way. It was not. <laughs> our, our baptisms were the funnest those days. Baby pools beside the building somewhere there. We would pump, water, pump it, pump it, and carry water with buckets. <laughs> come in, so that in the morning we, we have no trouble. And then we would come in the morning it leaked. <laughs> the church is flooded. We have to find a way of sealing the baby pool, clear the church, and dump more water so that we'll do the baptism at whatever cost. And it was like here. So people have to sit. You have to sit down. You sit down. <laughs> Imagine God used those moments. And these people, they were immersed in water. <laughs> they still bear the testimony of Christ until this day. If we despised the, new be the, the, the small beginnings, we couldn't be here. We could have just said, well, this thing ain't working. God, what's it going to do with makazi ukuinji? Na tungeenda makazi na tufanyi, for real. Na tupate besha. But at the end of the day, this is more fulfilling to see many people getting born again, many people making informed decisions about their lives and to follow Christ and to serve God. So I pray that as God has given us the opportunity to serve Christ, let us serve Christ faithfully. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you for this opportunity tonight. 
to come and read these stories that are actually your words for us to learn from the men and women of old and what transpired. And the reason why you provided this for us is so that we don't go back and do the very same things that these people did. You've given it to us so that we'll be wise in our daily living, that we'll have wisdom for each day, that we'll not think highly of ourselves, that we'll not be selfish, that we'll not be prideful, that we'll not just think of ourselves every time. You're reminding us to love one another with a pure heart. For love thinks no evil. Love does not envy. And we see this even in the life of David. Even at the end of Saul's life, David is still concerned that he was still your anointed one. I pray that when it comes to us serving you, Lord, we'll remember to serve you faithfully. Love will abound within us. We'll love each other. You said it in your word that when we love one another, the world will know that we are indeed your disciples. So I pray that that will affect our relationships and even the people out there will know that we love you. We thank you, God. As we disperse tonight, we pray for your blessing upon our fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The Lord bless you, church. Thank you for coming and have a wonderful evening.